why don't why don't we kick off with you kind of introducing yourselves and then giving a little bit more background of like where you are and kind of what you're hoping to get from, from the session. Okay, so I can start. Um, I graduated from college three and a half years ago. And at college, I double minored in theater and music theater. I've always loved um, the arts and music. So I did a lot of songwriting back in college. Once I graduated, I have a full-time job in tech and I do marketing, but I've always continued songwriting and writing and singing and studying guitar and production outside of work. Um, I haven't really, it's all like I do it, but I don't put it online or anything. Um, not to the stage of putting it online or actually building any, any online or public persona yet. Um, but it's something I've been thinking about and, you know, how do I, how do we do it? Uh, so a lot of these questions that Nathan and I came up with come from uh, thinking about how to start doing it and manifesting uh, songwriting and music. Okay, awesome. I guess I'll go next. Um, but, you know, to give a little background on myself, my name is Nathan. Uh, you can probably tell, is my name Nathan on this? Yes, it is Nathan on there. So anyway, um, but yes, uh, so Kathy and I went to the same school um, at Princeton and um, uh, we started Princeton East West a theater together in Asian American Theater Company. Um, I met Kathy through her senior thesis show and she inspired me to do theater as a minor also at Princeton. I did a one man show at Princeton where I wrote original music for it. It was an Asian American, it was an exploration of my Asian American identity by exploring different Asian American stereotype characters. And for each of those characters, I wrote different songs for them. And I think that has been my most meaningful musical experience. Um, but uh, I graduated in 2019, so I've been out of school for an, a year and a half. I've also tried being an independent artist, um, but it's been a little bit difficult to have the support and um, structure to, to create music as I did back in college. Uh, I've only released one single. I think I shared it with you a while ago. And I have another single lined up, but I just haven't had the means or time to, to do it on my own. But the big thing that I'm focusing on right now is I'm working on a crowdfunding campaign to professionally record the music for my senior thesis. So that's been occupying a lot of my time. Um, and yeah, I just, it's being a musician is hard. I don't know what to do, <laughs> but yeah, I hope uh, that gives a little bit of background on what I, where I am at as well. Absolutely. And, you know, like I was telling Kathy earlier, like I, I've been through many, many different sides of this myself, so I can certainly relate uh, both the feeling of like kind of the overwhelm feeling as well as just thinking like, what are the actual steps? There's so we only have so much time, so much energy, so much uh, resources, like where do we put our focus on? And so, um, you know, hopefully we can, we can get some clarity for you here. Um, now, I think that, uh, you know, Kathy, I'm looking at the, the questions that you, you sent over. And I think like the, the first one here that you have, I think is uh, probably really appropriate for both, both of you. It says, you know, what things should we be prioritizing to do at this early stage? What's really important for our action plan this uh, early? And I think this, this answer is like, really kind of cloudy because the, the, the reality is that it depends. It depends on what your overall career goals are and, and what it is you like the, the path that you would like to take to get there. So like independent artists or established artists who have some kind of um, backing through like traditional means like a label or publishing deal, uh, working in a studio or something like that, they, they all have different paths to get with where they are. And just like in the same way that a musician's career can look wildly different depending on who you ask. Like there are some people who, you know, for most of my career, it was touring, playing rock and roll uh, and selling merchandise. And, and like, it, it depended on that live experience. 
Now, I know other musicians who do really well who've never played a live show. They, all they do is write music in the studio and they license it for uh, soundtracks and that kind of thing. And then there's people who are kind of like really in between or who do work for hire, that sort of thing. So it, it just kind of depends. So, um, you know, for this kind of first step, I would say like, what is your hope? Like, what do you envision uh, a career to be for yourself? Like if you could choose from the, the areas that you're aware of or that you have experience in, what is it that you gravitate towards? I think for me, it would be songwriting is a huge part of it. Um, I know I love writing and I also do love performing and singing as well. So I think for me, it'd be both performing and writing. Um, and I think I want to create like bodies of work. <laughs> And by bodies of work, do you mean like uh, like an album, a collection of songs, um, concept albums, and that kind of thing? Yeah. Okay. That's a goal of mine. Uh, what about you, Nathan? Hmm. Okay. Um, I think I also um, love songwriting and performing. I think um, what I would really love is to have some sort of uh, structure or team that could help me like you know actually get um music um you know out there I think I struggle so much with having the motivation or scheduling and it makes me think like maybe the goal would be to try to find a supportive label um as opposed to being an independent artist um but you know I actually have to build some sort of following or actually have some work to show to a label to actually have and I don't even know, if it, but then I've heard like mixed things about labels too. So I don't, you know, just. <laughs> it depends I, on the label uh, is yes. kind of the, the answer. Um, I will say that these days labels do less for artists than they've ever done before. Um, oh. What you probably are more looking for would be like an artist manager or a collaborator who, who can keep you accountable. Um, and so I, I think uh, before we kind of dive into some of these other steps, um, there was another thing that um, you, you put on uh, on this list here. It said like, what what should we focus on? Building a following or making music? Is, is there is there a way to do both? And I think it's kind of related to this too. Is and like, what what do you actually focus on? And so. I would say that you should always begin with that kind of overarching vision of what it is that you would like for your life or how you want your art to be expressed. Uh, by the sound of it, both of you kind of want to kind of take the traditional artist path where you, you write your own material and you perform it. You're not just like writing for other people uh, or to, to do work for hire, but you actually want to like embody your songs, uh, which I think most creators, this is, that, that's kind of what we want because it's the most fulfilling uh, for, for those of us who you know have something that we want to say. So I would say always like keep that in the back of your mind in terms of like whatever decision making process. But oftentimes it, it's helpful to step back and think about um, this perspective from a different industry or even uh, like a different perspective in it. So uh, let's for a moment pretend that this like making music wasn't the dream, but your dream was to like open a restaurant. Like you, you love cooking, that's passion of yours, you do it on the side, you maybe you share it with friends and family, but you actually want to do this like as a full-time career and have your own restaurant where you determine the, the dishes and, and the environment and everything like that. So th if, if you wanted to do that, then imagine you had that same kind of question. What should I do first? Should I begin by, creating a following like customers or do I begin by like perfecting the dishes and figuring out like the kind of food I want in this case like you most likely if or if you're talking to a friend of yours who's doing this you'd probably like you should figure out like the exact dishes and the food first and then worry about the customers and I think early on in, in your career it's very very similar at some point you'll have to pivot or at some point you'll have to do both uh, but 
like just as there's no kind of like 100% set path for the artist, there's no set path for the restaurant tour either. Because some people begin with like pop up shops, like th that's the equivalent of like uh, a single or performance, right? You're like, okay, I'm gonna borrow someone's restaurant for one night and 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 serve my food, see how it goes, and if it does well, I know I've got a viable path. And other people might step out a little bit more and like get a food truck. And then there are those who are like, I'm going to sign up for this five year lease and it lease out like, you know, a half million dollars worth of uh, equipment and build out this commercial kitchen. And, you know, if I mess up, I'm millions of dollars in debt. Like, so there's a full range and musicians are no different, right? There's, there's those who kind of use it as a side hustle as they kind of build their following or perfect their craft. And then at some point, people will make that switch. Either they kind of do things that are a little bit more ambitious, like, okay, I'm gonna book my first tour or um, do a release or hire a publicist or something, or they're gonna go out and go shopping for like a label or some kind of major deal. So there's no like like exact path that you can copy. It, it's gonna largely be uh, dictated by a lot of other forces. And unfortunately, a lot that are like out of your control, like what the market's like, or if you're currently living in the middle of a pandemic where you can't go out and perform or, or, or if people don't feel comfortable with going out. So like it's, it's going to be um, just thinking about that overarching vision and using that to guide your steps along the way. And so I think um, there is certainly a way to do both. And, and if you kind of hold that vision close to heart, then you could say, well, like there's, you can either like, if you're really good with like um, allocating your time, you could say, I like say, say songwriting is your passion. Like I really want to like figure out this, the art of expression and crafting the perfect song. Then maybe say like, okay, of the amount of time I can dedicate to this every week, say it's 10 hours. It could be more or less depending on where you are, but let's say it's 10, then you could say, okay, I'm gonna dedicate five hours, 50% of my time to songwriting. And then um, maybe so many hours for performing and then so many hours for like the career development piece of it. And, and so whatever that looks like for you would just kind of largely depend on where you are in the process and uh, what you kind of naturally gravitate towards. And, you know, being, starting out, being totally independent, knowing that like you got to kind of tackle all of it, it, it's good to like be mindful of how much time you have and um, how, so that you can start making those decisions. If Once you have that kind of vision, you can just test it out and see like how it works for you, how it feels. You could adjust it along the way. And I find that like having that kind of pie chart mentality, especially if you could say, I am, no matter what happens in my life, I'm gonna dedicate this amount of time uh, throughout the week or this amount of time every single day. Now you've made a commitment and a plan for yourself that you can follow. And like any other plan, it allows you to kind of test your results and say, okay, is this working for me or not? Um, Nathan, you, you kind of mentioned this piece of like, like the wanting someone to keep you accountable, like, especially when you don't really like feel like doing things or, or you're not, you like, you need someone who like kind of continues to like hit that button. And the two of you can actually do that for one another by keeping each other accountable. Like, hey, th these are my goals this week. Or like, you can bring in other people into your life, like until you get say like an artist manager or something, you can just say like, I'm gonna like, it could be something as simple as I'm going to put in my calendar and, and like make an appointment for myself. Like this is the amount of time I'm going to block out and I'm not going to do anything else. I'm going to turn the rest of the world off while I work on this one thing, but you can also check in with each other to make sure that you're actually on track and, and doing the thing. Um, one of my, my favorite books uh, on the subject is the war of art by Stephen Pressfield. And he talks a lot about this, like, all creators face this natural thing called, he calls it resistance. And the resistance can come in the form of self-doubt. It could come in the form of confusion. Like, I don't know what to do. It could come in the form of like perfectionism. And like, I don't wanna release this thing or perform it unless it's absolutely perfect. Whatever it is, um, that force is preventing you from moving forward. So he has a lot of really good techniques and, 
and, and, and his book on how to address that. And so I would highly recommend that as like a resource. Um, and then as you're also like kind of along the same lines, thinking about that pie chart, I would say like, make sure you dedicate time for yourself for actually like learning and growing. So there's, there's a lot of different skills out there and like taking time to figure out what it is that you, it would be helpful for yourself to learn versus like stuff you need to know enough about. So if you hire someone that you know they're doing the kind of work that you would like and that you're getting a fair rate and that sort of thing, like all that should be kind of folded into this kind of idea of like, what, what is you, what do I do right now? I actually um, just bought the War of Art. I saw it in one of your podcasts I was listening to, so I just ordered it. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, I mean, he's got a lot of other really good um, books on storytelling and writing, but but that is probably like the one of the most useful books I found in terms of like uh, creativity and and like pursuing that as a as a job. Yeah, that's really helpful about um, dedicating time and like making a pie chart and setting up appointments for ourselves. I think that's with like a full-time job, I think one thing that I've struggled with is just finding the time during the week and like dealing with being tired after working during the weekdays and then finding like squeezing time on the weekends. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the same thing, like as you're budgeting like time, you can also think of it as like money or energy as well. Like, so for example, if you're wanting to save up like Nathan you mentioned you're, you're doing a crowdfunding campaign right now for um to, to help pay for an album and so you could think like okay what are the other things that I might want to spend on is it is it equipment is it um a vocal coach is it like you know whatever it is you might think of like you will invest a certain amount into your career like because early on it's going to be more spending and investing than it is receiving and that's just the nature of things but like you could think like of the resources I have, where do I want to allocate it to? And it should, honestly, it should mirror like your time because you should be able to prioritize number one, what the thing that matters to you to the most and, and, and then work from there. So a lot of times we get it backwards. Uh, a lot of artists spend their time, uh, their money on the things that are actually least important to them. And this is why like, although I, I'm happy to do uh, marketing coaching and social media uh, training for artists. I'm always like, is this your goal? Is your, is your job like wanting to be a social media manager or is your job being an artist, right? Like we, we need to prioritize based on, on those goals and then work around those goals. So everything should, should mirror that. Um, I think you had a, speaking of like kind of investing. So you, had this question here, like if we need help with producing our music, where do we find uh, reasonably affordable for starting out uh, producers? Fiverr, Upwork, um, what's our affordable budget and for self-producing uh, EP or album and, and so on. So um, I should mention here that there's like a full range of, of definitions when we talk about the word producer and what people claim as like a producer role versus like what is actually done because there's there's pre-production, there's post-production, there's uh, co-writing, all kinds of stuff. So when you talk about production, what do you what are you actually asking about or like more specifically, what is what are you hoping to get? Um, for me, that question meant, and for Nathan, it might be something different. I'll let you speak to it. But for me, that question was, um, if I write a song on the guitar or on my MIDI keyboard, the only production I can do with it is pretty basic. Um, but if I wanted to find someone to help me make a nicer version of it and do the mixing and mastering, um, as well as like produce from the very basic track that I made. So you mean someone to help with instrumentation and like kind of bringing life to it, like, hey, um, I need help with someone creating the, the beats and like maybe keyboards or other tracks. and and like a fuller expression of what the song is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the same goes for me. I don't really 
have any instrument <laughs> experience. I've been trying to learn the guitar five times and I failed, <laughs> not failed or just kind of given up every single time. And um, like Kathy, I don't have too much experience with um, producing backing tracks. I have logic, but like I, it probably I'm needing to put time, it's either putting time into learning it myself and becoming the independent artist that everyone is always like, hey, be the independent artist or, uh, or, or just trying to find people to work with who could actually do that. And, um, but then that, I don't know what is it, there. It just, I don't know. It just, I end up kind of like something, somehow it just ends up kind of like halting at like the idea process and then m trying to make, make it grow. And then it just kind of stops gotcha. is usually what happens for me. Yeah. And so for this kind of thing, I would ask kind of like largely the same question. Like what is it you, you ultimately want? Do you want to be the person that can ultimately do all those things and create those things? Or do you want to just kind of mostly focus on what you're doing now and be at a level where you can comfortably outsource some of those other elements of the music? I think I would be comfortable outsourcing the production and mixing and mastering pieces because I think my focus would has always been and will be like writing the songs itself and singing. <laughs> what about you, Nathan? Same goes for me. Oh, I love attention. So that's why I I want to say ah, I'm such I mean, I want to sing and write my own music. But I feel like I get discouraged because that's like literally what everyone wants to do. So it's just like, what makes me special compared to like, all these other people who are doing the exact same thing. Yeah, well, I want to worry about like other people wanting to do the, the same thing. I think what makes you special, what makes each of you special is that you each bring a very unique story and perspective in terms of the work that you're doing. So just because like everyone wants to be a songwriter doesn't mean that they will all write the same song. Uh, you know, I, I recently did a podcast on this and kind of began with like, how many love songs exist in the world? Like the reality is there are more songs than any person could ever consume in their whole lifetime. How many books are written? How many photographs or paintings and yet we still want more you know we've had like two and a half dozen mcu uh films and people like no that's not enough I, i'm i'm subscribing to disney plus i gotta get some more of that so like whatever it is there's always more because there's fuller expressions of it and the more that you lean into what makes you unique like by your own personal story the more uh, that other people will be able to connect with it because you'll be able to say things that are uniquely yours as opposed to anyone else's. And so that's why I want to kind of mention like both of you care a lot about the, the craft of writing. And if you spend more time in the craft and learning how to develop better techniques, that will also in turn help you kind of narrow in and what makes you you as opposed to like literally any other songwriter on the planet or songwriter that's come before. Like we all have this kind of uniqueness to ourselves. That's that's going to be your greatest strength, no matter uh, what part of the industry you're in. Uh, and, you know, I always say like lean in on that as opposed to like how well you can emulate what other people are doing. And, um, you know, and this could also go for like how you choose to approach your career as well. But since you're both like kind of leaning in towards this, like I want to focus on like the primary act of, expression through like writing the song then I would say like there's a couple ways to go about this um, one is if you're open to like having a co-writer to help with like some of the other parts of the music that could be one and if, if you find a good collaborator who can do this then oftentimes it's not necessarily like an upfront cost it's more of a shared expense in terms of time and investment and then on the back end they would they would, you would have an arrangement where you have a split if you write like songs and you want somebody to say okay i want you to program the drums and do guitar bass keyboards uh horn section whatever like the, there's the reality is like there's no real like standard standard rate the range is all over the place and it can depend on um talent skill experience it could also just depend on like how much people are able to get because 
maybe they were lucky and helped someone whose song took off. And so all of a sudden they're able to charge a whole lot more, even if they're only nominally better than say the person who hasn't had that runaway hit. Mm -hmm. So uh, unfortunately there's no like industry standard when, when it comes to this kind of thing. And I would suggest like um, one way of like approaching this is, is like maybe like having a collection of songs. Like if you were to create your own Spotify playlist of like your favorite songs and things that you, what you like about those songs, figure out who's a part of the songwriting team, who's a part of the production team. And then as you vet potential producers, you could say like, I want someone who does this kind of thing. Like if you really like Rick Rubin's kind of work, then you'd be like, I want someone who can, you know, do the, this type of, type of production work. Um, I will mention like, uh, you know, Kathy, you mentioned like someone also like, you, you mentioned mixing and mastering and most producers aren't gonna do the mixing and mastering. That's gonna be like an audio engineer. Um, usually mastering people just do mastering. Like their ears are like very particular and mixing engineers tend to only mix. Um, mm -hmm. There's a few people who will do both and, and then, an even smaller slice of that would be producers who do all of it end to end. But most like, it's kind of like if you want to work with someone who's kind of a jack of all trades and uh, like kind of master of none, or if you want to focus on someone who's like really, really good at like the song development, and then they will know who to turn to to help you get like really good mix, mixing and mastering. I see. I've just been doing some research on my own and finding um people who do any or all of those things on sites like Upwork and Fiverr um <laughs> and putting together a budget based on that yeah but so and, it's and, not fancy at all but hopefully so it'll get the job actually, done <laughs> one way to just kind of get into it is like there's a lot of folks who are in who are studying music in college and, and in particular like audio and engineering audio technology and a lot of them will actually, they need projects. So a lot of them will mix or, or do mixing and mastering for like free or near free. And that's kind of a good resource to like start developing relationships for people who need someone to learn with. And like, if you're on kind of a tighter budget, because then they could say like, hey, let me grow with you. And, and, and if they are doing a good job, then, then great. And if they you don't like what they produce, then you can say like, no, thanks. Like, I'm not going to release that. I, I'm going to mm -hmm. take my files and we release it in a different kind of way. So that that's kind of a way to like try out a couple of different things and kind of um, develop relationships with other folks who are kind of just getting into the industry. And so that, that, that's one way. Um, there are a number of networking groups. Like um, there is one in particular, the Asian Creative Network. I think it's called like, ACM songwriters or producers or something like that. And there's a bunch of folks on there who are always looking to donate their time or to like tackle projects or that kind of thing. Yeah, we're both in that group. Okay. So, <laughs> so th that could be kind of a way to start. And, and then like, I would say like before like hiring out kind of like, especially on the upper end of the budget, like figure out if like, do a couple of tracks and see if you like the process of working with other people. Cause it, it might turn out that you, you go through it a couple of times and you're like, you know what, nobody's like really capturing my vision and maybe, I, you know, I need to do more of it. And then in that case, that means, you know, spending more time, maybe learning a slightly different skill set until you find the right person, just so that you aren't losing momentum when it comes to like your own creative work. Makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, you know, like Nathan, you mentioned you have um, you have Logic, and it, it's a great, I think, a really good program to kind of learn on. And like, if you if, you, if you, even if you just have some time to kill and you just want to like learn um, how to use it better, there's a lot of great like YouTube walkthrough videos of people who are like, this is how I'm creating this song. And even if you don't have like a MIDI controller with you or anything, you can just go through. And what I find is like. I'll just like go through the like the menus with them, the settings and, and turn the dials, so to speak. And it's just so I get comfortable with the process of walking through that. And so it's a it's kind of a, a, a way to like get into it without feeling overwhelmed. Cause when it's your own material, we tend to like 
guarded a lot more than if we're just like playing around on somebody else's like kind of creation. And some of those people actually will give you the files to download. Like here's here's the the working file you can download, the stems that you can kind of play around with, and you kind of uh, create something similar to what they're doing, or you can take it and run with it and remix it, and create your own version of that. And so that's oftentimes some of the the best ways of learning how to um, jump into that world. And even if you don't end up using all those skills yourself, uh, like for your creating your own songs, I found it to be really, really helpful uh, as you're working with other people. So like when, um, you know, whenever I jump in the studio and I'm working with uh, audio engineers to to record our album, I, I, I can speak their language. Like, you know, like if if they're having some kind of effect, I'm like, oh, you know, let's, let's add some more compression on that or let's do this kind of thing. And I can leave it up to them on how much to apply, but we can at least like hear it. And I, I can kind of understand the techniques a little bit. And, and it's just, it's also really helpful to like understand the kind of the language of audio engineering a bit so that if someone making music for you, like either a producer or you're getting it mixed, you can also like, you can, you, you can be more accurate in describing what you're looking for. So it's not just like, I can't understand the lyrics or I, can, I, I want I want the vocals higher or maybe you could be like okay maybe if you turn up like the the EQ right around the 2k range I might have a more clarity here or you, you can start differentiating the instruments in, in, in a way that uh, will be more meaningful to your work yeah no I think no that makes a lot of sense I think maybe I've tried maybe I'm realizing I've been trying really, really hard to be the independent artist when I actually really, really don't want to be an independent artist, like the all jack and all trades to do everything by myself. I think that really overwhelms me to the point where I just don't want to do anything. Yeah, um, that, that, that makes sense. And that, that happens to people all the time. And so the, the thing is like, in any area of your life, it, it's best to like develop your strengths instead of trying to develop your weaknesses or the things that you actually don't want to do. Because then what you'll find is that you won't actually enjoy the craft and the, the act of creating because then it's going to feel like a chore. And so if you can find other people who understand what you're trying to do or who work well with you, it, it, it's, it's a huge blessing. Like having that kind of base level of skill is helpful. So you can just um, communicate with them well and understand what they're doing. But, but like by all means, if, if someone else like can do a better job of, of some other part of it, then, then find a collaborator who can, who can work with you on that. Mm -hmm. Let's see. And, and then you, um, Kathy also asked like, what's a reasonable affordable budget for uh, still producing an EP or, or album? Uh, again, there's like, this is going to be a huge, huge range, depending on like how much work you want done, how many songs you want done, and, and, and that sort of thing. I will say I've, um, I've run the full gamut, but it also kind of depends on like who you know as well as like what skills you have already in. So if you're working as um, individuals, it's going to be a little tougher than say like if you were in a band and everyone has like a little, you know, a variety of skills. I, I would say that if you're going into a studio to record an album, um, even just like a like a demo, you know, it's it you're probably at minimum going to be paying a few hundred dollars per song. Uh, some people will charge by the hour. Some some will charge like per song, um, and the per song thing will be like you know uh, unlimited amount of time within you know certain reasonable limits. And, and so uh, you, if, if you begin there, that would be an idea. Or you can always say like, I'm making the album for X amount of money and that's it, no matter what. And you just kind of shop around until you find someone who's willing to, to do that with you. Mm. <laughs> I mean, I would say like our, our first album for, for our band, um, getting recording, we did most of the recording ourselves. So like, I had to pay for a U-Haul rental to like move equipment into my garage. But like, even after that and like hiring someone to master the album, I think we paid 
three or four hundred dollars total for like nice a, a full album and uh, you know ironically that was like our best selling album so even uh, though like later on we were spending well. like thousands of her <laughs> song it was like wait how come <laughs> how come we can't do that but you know again like i mentioned like there are factors you can't control one of those factors is like this big shift from from physical merchandise and cds to to streaming so then or you know concert experiences and selling t-shirts versus the cd so it just there are things that just change and, and you just kind of adapt with them uh, i will say that like as artists we're always wanting our stuff to sound the very best possible and that's not an unreasonable thing what we sometimes will forget is that um polish doesn't necessarily make a better song like I mean, you think about like some of the most timeless songs out there, like say, I don't know, one of the best selling artists in the world, like the Beatles, most of their recordings were on like four track cassettes, like uh, with like, they're extremely muddy, um, you know, guitarists like Jimi Hendrix, his guitar was out of tune on his recording. Right? There are mistakes on like Sammy Davis Jr.'s like playing, like we, we often don't seek perfection, but um, it, the perfection and the like quality doesn't always determine the the power of the song it can help it it can help it bring it into fuller expression but it won't necessarily like make it more popular like you know like there's only so much you can find something and it's good to get it in the best shape possible because it's much more likely to get picked up for you know a playlist or a movie or something like that but it it, it doesn't like this is what I mean, where sometimes we have spend all our time and money thinking like this is the thing when really it's, it's not quite always that thing. Like mm -hmm. um, is, so it, it's okay sometimes to like have a starting place and say like, you know, this might not be the dream production version of the song, but it's good enough to get it out there to let people hear my voice, to hear what I'm trying to say. And then, you know, you can always go back and re-record songs. You can always like, you know, you write new songs and, and like the next album can be closer to what you envision it for and, and so on. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I really like the, <laughs> what you're talking about, about only spending a couple hundred dollars on your first album. I think that's where like, uh, Nathan's fancier. <laughs> Nathan, your, mm -hmm. your crowdfunding project is more um, fancier, but I'm like, I'm happy with doing just <laughs> you haul truck recordings <laughs> no the only reason it's fancy is because I'm working with like a professional studio that like that that like specializes in crowdfunding otherwise I would probably do the exact same thing um but no it's like um no that like it all makes sense like to kind of like think like you know things don't necessarily have to be like perfect or like complete I think um, the thought that I have is just like, I think my strength and perhaps Kathy also has the strength is that we can make song concepts and song lyrics and like have like the general melody, but then that's, at least for me, that's the, the, what I can specialize in. And then is it, a, it's more, is it a matter of just like me putting it out there and seeing if anyone will bite or um do I need to like have like really complete ideas to actually show people because that that's something I can imagine myself actually doing like finishing a song like the lyrics and like the melody and then trying to shop it around but yeah I mean it just kind of depends on what your overall intention is with it and mm -hmm. and since you both want to be performing artists uh like I would say like it if you want to outsource a certain piece of it, like at this stage, if you can find a collaborator, someone to help, um, you know, who, who you just work well with, who can, you know, tackle on some of the parts that you don't like as much, or who's, who specializes in those other parts, then you'll find it, like you'll probably be able to get more songs done and, and, and out there. So like, you know, you might have like a certain body of work, even if they're in demo form to help get you there for someone who's like, okay, I see the potential in this and I, I, I think I can take it and, and bring it to the next level. And so, 
yeah, that that's certainly an, an option. But like, um, you know, if you, if you want to invest into like the time, money, and energy into like creating an album and say like, this is what I can do, like at, at its best form, and I want someone to do this, that could also be a different path because now you have kind of a body of work that you're trying to get other people to either emulate a little bit to a certain extent or to say like, this is what I'm trying to express. Like the, this is the sound I would like. Can you do this? And then you can work with someone to, to do that. But like if you were writing to sell to say um, a licensing agency, then it would look very different. If you're, if you're writing for the song to shop it to another performing artist, then the incomplete version is fine for that too. Like, so it, it just kind of depends. Like there, people have a very, uh, uh, there's like a very diverse way to engage with our art. The other thing we tried was um, we've written two tracks before that we found from producers on YouTube. <laughs> Yeah, I tried writing that way. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of different ways to make it happen. So, like, um, you know, for myself, most of my career it was writing in band group form. But like, I, I used to be the primary music writer and did none of the lyric writing because um, I had a lead singer at the time who didn't want to sing anybody else's words, and then. It wasn't until like our third album that I started writing out other parts of it. And, you know, I, when I started, I didn't do any keyboards by the time our third album rolled around, I did all of our keyboards. And then we had a lineup change again and all that changed all over again. And now I'm doing the bulk of the lyric writing for a new body of work that we're creating. And then uh, Joe, who, who you've, um, you've met on the artist think tank calls, he's kind of oftentimes will tackle on the, the music part. And so even though he lives in Portland and I live in Cincinnati, we're able, we're still able to collaborate. And we mostly just use Zoom. I'll be like, here's a Google doc, here are the, um, the lyrics, and then we'll just play around with ideas. And sometimes I'll be like, oh, I have a core chord structure or melody I would like, and I just show it to him and then he'll, he'll play it back to me. And, and that's also really helpful for me, like hearing someone else give voice to the song and, and their interpretation of it, because then I can be like, oh, like I like this even better or like, I don't like that at all. And so um, that's where having a collaborator is really helpful. And, you know, even if they're not like fully vested in, in your career as like a co-creator, like having a, th that producer role can also be helpful in that. And so, a lot of times it's going to be kind of like trial and error. Same thing with like, do at what point do you hire out for other elements of your career, like the business side of things, like um, like getting a manager or a booking agent or a publicist or all these other things. There, there'll, there'll be different crossroads depending on where your career is and what you would like to do next with it, where you'll need to make those decisions. But having some kind of base knowledge and, and a very, very clear vision of, what it is you ultimately want to have will help you at every one of those points. Mm. Really, that's really wise advice. Thank you. <laughs> sure. And so I, I think we actually kind of went through all your questions here. Were, were there other things that you're wondering about or um, things that I could help me answer at this stage? Um, the other question, I guess it's not like too, too. Um, important for our stage, but something we were curious about was how did you make money from music starting out earlier on? And how do you, how did you like get health insurance while you were a musician? Oh, that's right, I saw that. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so there's a, well, the, the insurance thing has really changed uh, with the passage of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, but oftentimes if you, if you aren't getting it through like a, a main employer, you can join like a, a, a group to get group rates, like so a, a severely discounted rate. Uh, one of my favorite resources for that is joining ASCAP. Uh, it's the Association of Songwriters, Composers, Authors and Publishers, I think is what it stands for. Uh, they, they're a pro, uh, what's called a performing rights organization. So you would register, uh, actually before I 
Dive which Beaver did. Are either of you registered with a pro, like ASCAP, EMI, or CSAC? No. Okay, so this is something I would, as you, you asked about next steps, I would definitely do this as a next step. Um, I would do a little research on that. You'll see acronyms for this all the time, like ASCAP or BMI, and then the other one is CSAC, S-E-S-A-C. They are all pros. And they, what they do is they help you with um, kind of with the rights of your songs and, and collecting royalties at some point as they're getting played, whether you, you yourself are performing them or uh, as you're releasing them in public uh, in some kind of way. And they, they also advocate for a lot of like laws and, and policies and programs that help benefit artists. So they're, they're just kind of good to have ASCAP is going to be the most expensive one. I, I think it was like a hundred dollars the last time I checked, and and that's like a one-time fee. CSAC is free. I don't remember what BMI is, but they all kind of function the same kind of way. They just like in in, in terms of what they pr protect in terms of your rights. Um, one of the things I like about ASCAP is that there is an option to buy into the group insurance because they, they, they're actually the biggest one. Uh, the, there's like tens and tens of thousands of like people in the group, so like employees. So when you buy into insurance, you get some really competitive mm -hmm. rates. And you can also insure your music equipment and you get discounts in other places as well. So that's why I like ASCAP. They, their terms are also um, you know, quite friendly for, for artists. So, um, but no matter who you go with, they all have some kind of version of that. So it's a, that, that's kind of the quick and easy way to get health insurance in a group. Uh, of course, you can always buy it on the government exchange program now through the Affordable Care Act. And it you know, might vary depending on where you live. Um, in terms of making money early on uh, through your music, you know, in this again, is gonna differ by the person, but since you both like performing, I would say like, you know, actually performing live is one of the best ways to kind of start getting some kind of income. And it also gives you the benefit of just getting in front of people. And, and the more you can do that, the, the better for you because you want to get as much like um, live rehearsal as, as much as possible to kind of figure out what your own voice is like, uh, how, you, how you like performing on stage and that sort of thing. You know, it's funny because I, I look at videos of like that are 20 years old of like when I performed in other bands and I'm like, wow, this is really horrible and embarrassing. <laughs> at the time, I was like, oh, we're doing so awesome. We're so cool. And I'm just like, what was I doing? <laughs> and and I, so, you know, I, it's nice because there's a record that you can refer to from, from like for growth as well. So I would say like play, get out and play as much as possible video yourself and then like try and objectively think how can I improve this like um, if you are if there's a lot of downtime between songs how you can address that if do you is there a better way of introducing the song like a lot of uh, performers would be like this song is called this and then they play the song it's like nobody really cared like no one's going to remember that in an hour so like maybe if you tell a compelling story about it they'll especially if there's a big emotional moment like there are things that we can do to improve the craft. And so, uh, but that a lot of it just comes with experience. So that that's one way. Uh, there's also like, you know, folks now have go through the Patreon route. Some people will, will crowdfund. Uh, some people, will, you know, they don't really care about performing life. So they'll try and double down on things like streaming or licensing. I will say that's, that's a little tougher gig. Like, I mean, I have a whole bunch of checks I received for royalties for less than a dollar for each time one of our videos went viral or something like that. I'm like, <laughs> didn't really have that huge payday, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but performing live, you can generally get some, some decent pay. Now that's probably gonna be shifting because of the pandemic and there's kind of a lot of gray areas there, but if you can draw a crowd, that will oftentimes help. And then you can, leverage those opportunities by, you know, selling merchandise or, or things like that. But like, as far as like, just a starting point, um, performing in places, even if you're playing for free and you, and you kind of get a share of like the tip jar, 
where you start building, um, get, getting support through like getting an email list or something like that, that that's all going to be stuff to help build from. Hmm. Are there still, for, um, are there opportunities to perform live while we're still in the pandemic you think or yeah so i mean people are performing live now it, it depends on city ordinances as well as states and some people are doing socially distanced concerts where musicians will perform like sometimes in another room i've seen that happen or they'll perform outdoors i think as we're entering in spring and summer uh, with the combination of vaccination rates increasing uh covid new cases of COVID decreasing and, and uh, you know, people are just getting more used to how things are. You'll, you'll probably start seeing more and more opportunities to do things, uh, particularly like in like outdoor spaces. And so uh, I would say, um, you know, what, where do you live? Like what, what cities are you in? I live in suburban New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Um, I live in a uh, suburb in LA, um, San Gabriel Valley. Gotcha. Um, so, well, like LA, you got the LA Weekly. I'm not sure, depending on what part of New Jersey, like are you in the Northern side, like closer to New York or like Central Brighton Beach area? Central. Like, okay. Uh, I don't remember the publication there, but like you can usually find your local alt weekly and and or newspapers or blogs in the area to find out like where performing venues are. And I would just start visiting their sites and seeing if they're looking for performers and or if they're having events on their calendars. And if so, um, you know, you can get in touch with them if that's of interest to you and seeing like, and then if you want to also be extra cautious, you can say like, hey, I, you know, what precautions are you taking? So I, you know, right now, um, I would recommend if you're able to, because I know it's different state to state, but like try and get those vaccines as quickly as possible and try and understand like what your area's policies are. Because the better that you can demonstrate you know how to like safely be a part of that and safely perform, the more likely those venues are gonna work with you because they don't want to get like fined by some authority figure or get shut down because they weren't adhering to policies. And so um, I would definitely look into doing those things if possible. Nathan, you're lucky you're out in California because it's like way easier. Like I was, I was just actually out there taking care of my folks, uh, my mom who was recovering from COVID. So uh, I, I was able to like schedule an appointment like the next day. I was like, this is not like Ohio. <laughs> it was way easier. Oh, wow. Oh, we're, we're, we're so glad that your mom is doing better. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. She's yeah. definitely recovering and and slowly gaining strength. So, uh, but yeah, I would say like, uh, figure out what those things are that you can do now. Uh, like they even make like masks uh, that are designed for speakers and singers that, that, are, that are more protective just because you tend to project more when you sing. And so, uh, you know, you might have like one or two, one or two of those in your arsenal as well. Um, or some people will like double mask it or, you know, there's, there's other ways. It's very, very hard to perform in, in a mask, by the way. Like I, I did it once last year, um, both uh, Joe and I were like double mask and it was just like, just standing up and playing. We were like super out of breath and we were like 30 feet from the next person. Uh, but it was still like, oh, oh my goodness. gosh. Oh God. But, uh, but you know, like you gotta do what you gotta do, right? Like, and, and if you're looking for those opportunities, um, it, you know, it, it's actually like good training because then it helps you uh, figure out, okay, if I'm really far from someone, how do I still connect with them on an emotional level? How can I get them to hear my song? How can I perform in a way that's so interesting to them? These challenges are actually like very, very good for performance to like figure out. Uh, and of course, there's um, there's virtual performances as well. Uh, those these days tend not to pay much, if, if at all. Um, but but that's certainly an opportunity. And uh, so if you are looking to create a body of work, like I know Nathan, you're like specifically focused on crowdfunding right now. But like if you're as you're thinking about these things, and Kathy, you mentioned that this as well. Like if you have a collection that's speaking to a very timely topic or you're doing something really interesting with it that you can um, parry over into other areas, 
you can also always consider like applying for an arts grant to help you develop that body of work. And that will oftentimes unlock more resources to be able to hire out for all those other areas that you wish for. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm helping an artist right now who, um, who some, sometimes is, is at the artist think tank sessions and he's developing a, a, a rap album and talking about Asian American history. So then, then I was like, okay, this is amazing. Like, what else can we do with this? Like we can bring in uh, teachers of, of the culture, we can develop curriculum. And, and so it became more than just an album. It became like a whole movement that could also be used in education. And so we were able to go on and apply for grants or major investors and things like that to help bring that vision to life. And now there's could be all kinds of collaborators, artists, appearances and things like that. But it, it kind of started like, what's a concept and how can we really roll with it? Um, we are, we just like the Science Foundation just launched another uh, grant, which I haven't even publicly announced yet, but we're working with uh, Rock Paper Radio for a campaign where we're giving people like miniature grants of 400 bucks to, to write a song or to pitch a song, uh, kind of addressing anti-Asian violence and support for Black Lives Matter. So like, if that's something like there's, there's people like us all the time that are just like, hey, we want, we want some artistic works. Here's a, here's a thing and, and you can apply for it. And, and, and that's another way to get some investment and, and oftentimes mentorship and collaboration all, all rolled in there all at once. Cool, that sounds like a really awesome project and a grant. Yeah, so we'll, I'll be adding it to our website probably tomorrow. Uh, I think you're both on our artist resource email, right? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I'll be, I'll be announcing it on there and then um, you know, on our, on our social channels. We'll, we'll have the, the link for the form. And so, you know, there, there's like, we're not the only ones doing this, but like there's, there's a lot of folks that I, if you just kind of look around, you can follow a lot of like arts foundations and, 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 and look for things. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure about New Jersey. I haven't looked into their own arts and humanities department, but like um, the, but California has got a really good like state department for the arts and they're always like developing new grants. Um, but, but most states, I mean, they, they, they get some federal money and then they do a lot of like low, like state fundraising. So I would say look for like the arts grants for your state. You, you can literally just put art, you know, New Jersey arts grants or something like that. And then see what criteria is, is out there. What, what grants are available? who's funding like music related types of things. A lot of times they'll have some kind of caveat, like, okay, we want you to like perform this in areas that don't have a lot of representation or we want you to teach something with this or whatever it is. You can, you can look at those things and say like, oh, that's something I actually want to do. And you can apply for And those grants will oftentimes be anywhere from a few hundred dollars to, to a few thousand dollars. So that, that's another way to kind of get resources to get the ball rolling too. Cool. That's so cool. Wow. Yeah. Uh, any other uh, questions or there's things you, you're wondering about, things you want to know? Um, I have like a question about um, maybe as another means of like just putting yourself out there, if songwriting for others is an avenue that I can, that we can also pursue while songwriting for ourselves um is and you said they're completely different tracks and i don't want to if it's too overwhelming to try to do those things i'm not, I'm you, not so you definitely that. can do both at the same time i i know a few people who do um i will say it's really challenging and i would say at, at this time it's just based on where you are in your uh, respective careers it's probably better just to focus on your own material and then slowly get into um like figure out how you can get a commission to do songs and things like that. But as you're developing your own craft, and especially if there's works that you're really, really proud of, you might consider entering them into songwriting contests. So there's like ISC, the International Songwriting Competition, uh, the different organizations will put this out. And when you join a pro, you'll, they'll have their own kind of songwriting competitions. 
that's a really good way to get recognition, particularly if you place uh, in one of those competitions, because you'll get a lot of attention from people seeking songwriters. And that'll give you a little bit more leverage so you can be compensated uh, for, for your song that will now will never be known as your song or be known as someone else's song, really. I mean, that's that's what happens. It's like hiring a ghostwriter. Like your credit might be in there somewhere, but the face, the performer, they're gonna kind of get the renown for it. Like I, I know someone who, who wrote most of Adele's album, but nobody knows. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> So he's, he's go, I mean, the industry knows he, he, he's a very prolific songwriter. And I, I mean, he's not hurting, let's just say. He's got a lot of royalties from one of the best selling albums in the last 20 years. I don't, I think he's all right. Okay. Well, okay. Then let me say like that. And then... um, are there any other next steps do you think we should do other than joining one of those performing rights organizations? Yeah, so I think uh, that, that that's definitely a great next step. I think um, figuring out a plan for yourself in terms of like how to allocate your time and your energy based on your goals, like aligning that as much as possible, and then finding like a realistic commitment that you can make for yourself and say like, you know what, this is what I'm going to dedicate to my craft. And, um, and then whatever that is going to look like, try that out for some time. And if it's working for you, then, then continue on. If you need to make tweaks and adjustments, like yeah, I, I would say give it a couple of weeks, then if you need to adjust, they, they adjust. I think sometimes we're just so ambitious and so overwhelmed with like a really big amorphous project that we don't break it down into those steps. And then it makes it like very difficult to figure out like what to do next, if that makes sense. Because then you're just like, well, do I work on social today? Do I work on this? And, you know, it, yeah. It's like, figure out your, your big priority things. And if, if like say songwriting is one of them and you only get a single verse out in, in a week, that's okay. Cause you're, you're still doing the work and then you can tackle some more of that the next week and, and, and so on. So I would say like, that's probably like a good chunk of time right there. Just like figuring out those steps and um, be, you know, and then of course, like taking time to figure out like when you work best. There's some people, they just want to work in like very large chunks of times, focusing on like one thing, like, okay, I need two hours or four hours just on this one thing. And there's some people who like get really bored and distracted and need to like shake it up every 30 minutes or something. So like part of like um, becoming that the artist is also learning how you work best and and once you figure that out, it'll be a lot easier to tackle one of those kind of bigger projects. Mm. Mm. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then in, dish, in addition, you said we should try to seek out performing opportunities as best as we can to try to like get experience. Yeah. That's something. I, I would definitely recommend it. Um, you know, if, if you feel safe and you're able to do so, then it's a great way because you both indicated like you really want to perform songs. So like go and perform songs. Like, and if you, you know, if you don't have enough original material to fill up like a set, like a 30 or 40 minute set, then, then you can fill it with covers, uh, making sure that the space allows for that. Some venues don't want you to do covers because they aren't paying the appropriate fees to do so so like learn that in advance and then you know and then set it up but like um you know a lot of booking is a couple months out so even if you like say you book a show it might not be till may or something like that and, and so it, it'll give you a few months to kind of prepare for those moments and so the the other thing is just getting to know the venues in your area or people who have performing artists is always a good thing anyway. Cause then even if they're not ready or you're not ready to work with them quite yet, having that relationship in place, having that in your back pocket will be helpful when you are. Mm. Is it like, so like you mentioned, like looking in like LA Weekly to see what workplaces are performing and reaching out to those venues to see if they are looking for performers or? Yeah, you, you can contact them and say, hey, you know, do a quick introduction to yourself and pitch and say, like, I'm interested in performing. Uh, do you have, have, you know, I would say pick a few dates and say, like, do you have these dates available or do you have any slots available? And, you know, if there's a show you really want to be a part of. Um, now, some 
some venues, this is still yet to be tested of what it looks like uh, post COVID, but a lot of venues will request that you fill up a bill like it's so they'll want like three X on there. And, and the other venues are gonna be like, they will book one slot a, a night at a time. So they won't want a whole bunch of artists. That's something you just kind of learn as you go through it. Um, you know, unfortunately, it's every, everyone kind of treats it a, a little bit differently. But there's a if if you want, there's a couple of other things. So um, there's something called the it's the indie music venue bible, and it's like a, a database if you want a, like a full national database. But there's also um, let's see what was it called. Hey, oh, Indie on the Move. Uh, so I'll I just put this on here. IndieOnTheMove.com. It's kind of like a free database. And what I like about that is that it's venues are reviewed by other musicians. So they'll tell you if they had a good experience, a bad experience, who to contact, what the size of the building is, um, what kind of genres they like, and so on. So that, that's a pretty good resource. If you want a professional account on there, I think it's something like $10 a month or something. And that will just give you more data, but you can definitely search the database and, and, and kind of um, get some of those, that initial information uh, based on your zip code. And there, sometimes they'll post uh, open uh, like calls for musicians on there too. Uh, the, the other kind of resources, sometimes I'll look in like Craigslist in the area or even Yelp, and I'll just put live music and see who's doing it. And so those are just some kind of good opportunities. Okay. Yeah, I, think, I think I mentioned in the last, or yeah, our last artist think tank, we talked about booking and I was like, you know, there's a lot of folks looking for uh, Asian American performers for Asian American Heritage Month. So you can check with like local, like, you know, you're both, uh, alum from Princeton, so you might check with your old student group and say, like, hey, can, can we come back and do something, even if it's virtually? And, mm -hmm. and so th there's some additional opportunities there, too. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, I remember you mentioning that. That is such a good idea. Um, are open mics also something to consider? Yeah, I, I don't know what that looks like in the world of COVID. Uh, so here's the other thing. If you are like, uh, if you have a live performing mic, like keep it with you all the time. This is a good idea to have anyway, because shared stage mics are really gross. And so like, uh, you can get something really, you know, basic, like sure has got the SM line. They're like 90 bucks. It's definitely worth having. And it's a solid like workhorse. Uh, but if there's a, if there are opportunities to sign up and, and have a slot, I, I would say that's not really a money maker. That's more of a just, it's a great experience to workshop the song, see how it feels live, uh, or just to kind of get the habit of getting in front of people. Uh, open mics are great for that sort of thing, but they're not necessarily like going to pay the bills or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, gotcha. Okay, no, thank you. That makes, makes sense. <laughs> awesome. Well, um, you, you know, I, I will say this, like, you know, we kind of covered a, a pretty good amount of ground tonight. And, and I know a lot of these are going to be the bigger, broader questions. It, it just tends to happen as you're kind of in the, like an earlier stage. But like, if you have additional follow-up questions later on, um, you know, maybe after a month or so, kind of like working on, on these next few tasks and you're like, hey, you know, I kind of wonder about this sort of thing. You can always uh, hit me up and, and let me know. We can schedule some additional time, and um, and then you can also bring it up at those artist think tanks as well, because it's just a great way to hear from a lot of different perspectives from people who are doing very very different things with their career. Like I, I've certainly had my my own path, but there's there's people who just work very differently, and so it's a great way to hear from a lot of perspectives as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Simon. Uh, it was so helpful uh, hearing your advice on all of these topics. I feel a lot more well equipped <laughs> to tackle the next steps now. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you so much, Simon. This is it. At, we know at least we kind there we have some things to actually think about as opposed to, you know, 
just being devastated about <laughs> um, about no yes but you know this was really really helpful thanks so much for taking the time to speak with us especially in your busy busy schedule no worries um, I mean it's an honor and privilege and again I, I've been there before I know what it's like and you know what we're trying to do with the with the Slants Foundation is to make the path easier for other people and so that you don't have to go through some of the same hurdles that, that I had to and some of the other board members have had to go through like ourselves when we were starting out. It's like, we just want to kind of be for others what we wish we ourselves had. So, you know, that's, that's why we try and keep it as just like as open and transparent as possible when it comes to like any of the questions or anything like that. So, you know, please like don't hesitate. You can, you can reach out at any time.